So over the years, the civil rights movements, uh, various movements in this country have certainly seen resistance from conservative white groups, and we're talking dating back you know, to uh, the Reconstruction era. And it's playing out across uh, this country right now. So Lawrence Glickman is here to walk us through his latest piece in The Atlantic. It's called How White Backlash Controls American Progress. Uh, Lawrence is a history professor at Cornell University. So, uh, Professor Lawrence, as is always the case with the Atlantic articles, the article is very, very thorough. And you go all the way back to sort of the first use of the use of the phrase backlash. And I said in my introduction to you that this is, you know, I, I define it as conservative white groups. But what you learn in the article is that um, it doesn't necessarily have to be about conservative white groups at times, even uh, White people who are who are progressive significant, have significantly pushed back against the civil rights uh, movement. So let's get a clear definition of what backlash means when it comes to this topic. Yeah, that's a, a great and complicated question because backlash is a term that had many uses uh, in American history. But in 1963, as the civil rights movement heated up, it really came to stand for what became known as the white backlash which was resentment against this pace and speed of the civil rights movement. And you're absolutely right that uh, it was not only conservatives and not only Southerners, but many Northern white liberals who participated in that backlash as they feared the results of uh, full racial equality that were promised by the uh, what became known as the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the uh, Voting Rights Act of 1965. Yeah, Professor, what's really interesting in your article, as Anne-Marie points out, uh, it really is very all-encompassing and detailed, but also nuanced, is you mention the origin of the word, which actually has its origins in fishing, um, which I thought was interesting because I am not uh, a fisherman. Um, but you also talk about, yeah, I thought that was really fascinating that, I mean, I think in the back of my mind, I knew that's where it originated from, but to see it um, in a scholarly article like yours um, and to put it in the context of how it's been used in, in English, in the English language as it's used here in this country was really, really fascinating. And there's another term uh, that uh, you use and that, uh, that is uh, focused on in the article, white fragility. So can you explain to our audience what that is and how do we understand it in the context of backlash? Yeah, well, I think a really important part of the language of backlash that white people used in the 1960s was that they really emphasized their own fears um, which were typically unfounded about what the consequences of racial equality would be. And they also emphasized their own fragility, uh, their own emotional concern. Uh, if you read articles where newspaper journalists and media people in general interviewed whites in the 1960s, the emphasis was very heavily on their own emotional well being, uh, their fears, their fatigue with the pace of civil rights. And I just found this so interesting because it's such an inversion of what was really going on in history, which is that African-Americans fighting for racial equality at that point had every right to be exhausted and fatigued and uh, fed up and feeling fragile. So it was kind of an inversion of what was actually going on. And so much of the discourse emphasized, however, that white fragility uh, rather than uh, African-American inequality, which was the crux of the issue. Um, I'm glad you explained that because it's a phrase that we're seeing sort of popping up on social media here and there. And, and when I see it, I, th I often think, well, if I was white, how would I interpret that? Um, uh, can we talk about um, sort of the concrete ways in which this backlash has affected policy, uh, whether it's a civil rights movement or, or other areas in history where the progressive groups were trying to get something else done, and as a result of the backlash, politicians buckled. Yeah, I think what's what I try to the point I try to make in the article is that backlash has become fundamental to modern conservatism, but it's also been a huge constraint on American progressive and liberal politics. And the reason for that is that so many liberal politicians um, are fearful of setting off a backlash. Uh, they're fearful of what happened in the 1960s happening again, which was when many white uh, people left the Democratic coalition and eventually joined the Republican Party. 
many backed off their previous support for New Deal type reforms. And um, so there are just so many examples of that happening where uh, uh, progressive movements have been constrained by the fear of setting off backlashes. We saw that, for example, with the women's movement in the 1970s and the campaign for ERA, which became demonized in a similar way to how the civil rights movement was demonized. Many supporters of that movement worried just as much about alienating um, people who might indulge in backlash as they did in supporting the cause. You know, you, you, you mentioned um, Reconstruction and Second Reconstruction. Can you um, explain why that distinction is so important? Yeah, that, it's a really important um, idea. The Reconstruction, of course, refers to the period after the Civil War when the United States had a brief experiment in racial equality uh, and interracial democracy. It didn't last very long. And one of the key elements about the Reconstruction period was how quickly uh, so many whites turned against it and thought it had gone too far and too fast. I'm talking within one or two years of the close of the Civil War, you began to see this discourse about, whoa, whoa, we need to slow down here, when the fact is that racial equality was really only a glimmer at that point, really only beginning. And in the 1960s, uh, historians began to refer to the Civil Rights Movement as the second Reconstruction. And what they went, meant by that was a second attempt to build a true interracial democracy. But what often happened was the same response to Reconstruction, the same backlash reconstru to Reconstruction, happened in reference to the Civil Rights Movement. And so you saw very similar um, language in opposing the Civil Rights Movement that had first emerged in response to the Reconstruction era. Um, so it has been said before, floated by some, that the presidency of Donald Trump was, in fact, a form of backlash to having the first African-American president. Uh, and now there's another uh, term that's being floated, uh, frontlash. Can you talk about that and perhaps what it means in, in context of uh, the, next, the next election? Yeah, um, it's a phrase that, as far as I know, was first used by Lyndon Johnson, who was president, of course, when the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act passed. And what uh, Johnson was, was hearing all this talk about how a racial backlash might cost him the election in 1964 when he ran against Barry Goldwater. And of course, Johnson won an overwhelming election that year. And what he said was that there were a lot more frontlash votes than backlash votes. And what he meant by that is that we hear disproportionately about people who oppose the civil rights movement, but there are actually a lot of Americans who support it. And he used that term frontlash to suggest that um, his, maybe the media was overemphasizing the role of backlash politics and underemphasizing the number of Americans who strongly supported the civil rights effort. Uh, Professor Lawrence, before we let you go, um, I, I just think that this is such a fascinating discussion. And there's one more term that I want to just throw at you and see and put it through your perspective and, and your scholarly research, which is uh, folks that use the term all lives matter or blue lives matter. I wonder if it fits into the framework of the, the term backlash, because I thought it was so interesting uh, when Emmanuel Acho, who's got a, a, a piece of video that he put out on social media that picked up millions of views, and he appeared on CBS This Morning today, and he was asked a question about Drew Brees and Colin Kaepernick and kneeling, and Emmanuel Acho essentially says, you know, you, to understand oppression, you have to be able to understand that if you tell somebody how they should protest their own oppression, that is intrinsically oppression. Uh, you can't tell someone how to protest their own mistreatment. Can you explain how that term, all lives matter, has been sort of co-opted as a way to reduce Black Lives Matter? Yeah, I think it gets back into a language that we saw in the first backlash to the civil rights movement, which is a language of special privileges. Um, so in other words, a lot of proponents of the white backlash saw racial equality as some special gift some special uh, demand by African Americans when it was simply a demand for social justice and equality. And I think we see the same thing with a language like All Lives Matter, which is saying, if we uh, call for 
uh, racial equality, that has, is somehow unfair and unjust. It's a kind of, again, it's another inversion of uh, demands for equality in which people who have uh, more privilege relative to others feel like their privilege is being taken away when we shine a spotlight on injustice in American society. Uh, Professor Lawrence Glickman, I wish I could go back to college and take some of your classes, but I've got your <laughs> articles and your books, because uh, I really, really do. We both enjoy uh, talking with you. Uh, it really is illuminating for us, and hopefully it is for our audience as well. Thank you, Professor. Uh, thank you very much for having me on. I enjoyed talking about it.